<clears throat> All right, it hasn't it hasn't started on YouTube, but I do see the link. Okay, it's now on. It's now streaming on YouTube. Uh, when I, I guess whenever we're ready, we can get started. We are starting. Start there. So, slideshow maybe if you want. Well, welcome. By the way, welcome to our first in, in person in a long time, everybody. Evening, everybody. Um, this is our hey, first right. in person meeting. <laughs> and since March of 2000, felt weird on the camera. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mike, I, don't, I agree. Awesome. With, I don't know if it's the battery, but we're not going to be able to hear you. You're, you're not coming through at all. Like, oh, no, me. Um, It's it's very broken up. Oh. I'll talk into it. So. Okay. Um, give it a try can you hear yeah. right yeah that That's sounds good you're, you're very clear now okay perfect. all right so i should go in front of the camera maybe you can try. i don't think yeah How's that? can you hear can you hear mike if he's talking mike talk loud hey can everybody hear me now uh we can hear barry better than mike okay well, come over here <laughs> all right Anyway, welcome again. As, uh, Paul, yes, we can hear you now perfectly. The um, technical difficulties, you know, we're, we are going to a hybrid event from moving forward. Uh, so we're obviously going to work out some of the things. But so anyway, thank you for those of you who are here. Ah, look at this. Um, we have pizza and, and soft drinks available. Please um, finish it all up, okay? Um, so anyway, uh, this is the October edition of the Garden State Java User Group. My name is Michael Redlick. I am the founder of the original Java Group in 2001, and then we rebranded in 2020 as the Garden State uh, Java User Group. So we're happy to have uh, uh, Nikolai uh, Parlov here tonight, but before we get started... Uh, Mike, Mike, real quick, I'm sorry. Do you have the YouTube running in the background? Because we're hearing like two words. I don't know. I'm just... Uh, um, let's, we'll fix that when we get, uh, I'll turn off, turn close the YouTube window. If you're running into the background, we're hearing you and you from 30 seconds ago. Okay. Well, a delay is expected. No, but you know what? Oh, I see. Okay. Oh yeah. 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 Close the YouTube. Yeah. Okay. Not the YouTube studio window, but the YouTube, YouTube. It's the next one over, I think. Yeah, that's it. Okay. That's it. That's, that's studio. Uh, Just close all the YouTube. Well, I don't know. May We have three lives. Wow. Yeah, that's a okay. This might be a. I've done it with this one. 
All right. Anyway, I think. Yeah. If, if you're just joining us, we're just having technical difficulty. This is our first uh, in person meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, it's not, this isn't working. So, okay, so, all right. Thanks for your patience on this. Um, so, our usual agenda, we thank our sponsors. Um, we went nonprofit uh, in 2020. And I think this is our first time here. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm the original founder of the Java Group in 2001. Um, when we rebranded, we have a nonprofit and we have co directors Barry Bird, uh, Chandra Gunter. Here with us, there are others in the group, but we also have one of our advisors, uh, Diana Liberos. So, thank you very much. So, and uh, we have a, a bunch of students here and other attendees that are here for our first in person event. So, for our sponsors, um, we have JFrog. There we go. They're our platinum sponsor, so we appreciate their support. Then our silver sponsor is Azul. We are partnered with DevNexus and their event will be in April of next year. The call for papers is out. So if you go to devnexus.com, I believe that's the correct URL. Um, if you're interested in uh, giving a talk, then please go ahead and submit an abstract. We have per meeting sponsors. Uh, JetBrains provides the one year licenses to IntelliJ IDEA and, and then also uh, Jakarta EE or Eclipse Foundation. They also provide um, hosting through Crowdcast, which we initially used. Um, and we, we've been trying some other things um, as well. So we, uh, we obviously want to acknowledge them. All right, what's new? Two great things happened last month. Java 19 was released on the 20th. And you can see all the different JEPs that are part of the uh, release itself. JDK, JDK 20, there are no JEPs assigned yet, at least not, you know, since I last checked um, a couple of hours ago, but that should be released in March of next year. And then two days later, we had the release of Jakarta EE 10. And um, that's uh, a bunch of updates, uh, you know, 20 of the specifications. And there's also a new core profile to complement the original platform and the web profile. So those are uh, dedicated specifications for the web and for uh, the core profile will be more for like cloud runtimes and, and things like that. It's a minimal set of specifications that you can use. So um, we will have some more at the end uh, when we have our uh, when we have our giveaway. And we'll learn more about that as we go. So I'm very happy to have Nikolai Parlog here with us, uh, a Java enthusiast focused on language features and core APIs with a passion for learning and sharing in articles, newsletters, in books, tweets, videos, and streams. Um, also in demo uh, repositories and, and uh, at conferences. Uh, so he's a Java developer advocate at Oracle, organizer of Ascento. Um, that aside, he is best known for his haircut. But, <laughs> so it's, well, that, that, that's actually mild in that picture there. But if you look at Nico Ivey, he's got that nice mohawk. Yeah, I don't have that problem. I, I, you know, nothing, nothing, nothing there. Mm -hmm. So, but, uh, but so that aside, um, you know, since I do a lot of news writing for InfoQ, I keep up with a lot of things Java. And one of the things I love to watch every couple of weeks um, is the Inside Java newscast featuring in Nikola. They are an absolute blast. Um, they, some of the other Java developer advocates are involved. And there's, it's just so many, fun, you know, so many things that are funny, but it keeps you entertained and you learn something. On top of that, there's a weekly um, sip of Java's by Bailey Carando, who visited with us uh, back in January of this year, I believe. And uh, so you can just find out more on inside.java. So on a personal personal note, Nikolai, it's always a pleasure watching all of your videos each, every couple of weeks. So that, that's terribly further, kind, thank you very much. So yeah, without further ado, it's very late in Germany. So let's uh, let's give a warm welcome to Nikolai Parlo. Yay. 
Hey, thank you. Uh, that was a that was a great introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, which takes all the words out of my mouth that I was going to say in the beginning. Um, right. So yes, it's light here indeed, and so I'm not home. I basically broke into some office, so uh, I can be here. So that means that I have like a less professional audio and video setup that I usually have. But we're here for the content, so I think it should be fine. Right. So we're going to talk about Amber Loom, Panama, and Valhalla. But before we go into that, um, I hear there are some, some people there, some some uh, some attendees that might not just know from the top of the head what exactly Amber Loom and Panama and Valhalla are, and that's perfectly fine. So I want to address that a little bit in the beginning. So Java is uh, it's a little bit special in the way that it's a standards-driven language. So it's not just like some company or some group of people coming up with a bunch of features and putting it together. I mean, that too, but also uh, it's a language that does have, does have a standard and that can have different implementations. And so that means that the process of developing Java is not quite that simple. There's the Java community process, which drives the, the standard forward mostly. And then there is the OpenJDK community, which is individual. It's, it's a, a community of individuals. They're all paid by companies, but like the OpenJDK community itself by its bylaws, it's mostly just a, a community of individuals working on the reference implementation of that standard. And so that's the whole, that's a whole organizational effort there that goes into developing Java. It's not like one guy sitting down and, you know, coming up with a bunch of new features. Instead, every change that is being made um, has to go through a process. And part of that is that within the OpenJDK community, so-called projects are formed. So when a larger issue is identified where Java has a shortcoming or the runtime has a shortcoming, so not just Java the language, but also, for example, the JVM, the virtual machine running the bytecode, or, you know, garbage collection or whatever else, um, all those pieces that work together, you know, they will have some kind of shortcomings, you know, perform uh, hardware characteristics change, so performance characteristics change. The landscape of problems evolves, so the language has to evolve. Uh, they, likewise, the APIs. So for all of those, um, oh, there's those identified nice. issues. Somebody's not muted. I'm not sure who that is, but if there would be, that would be great. Right. Right. Um, right. So uh, for all of those, uh, for all of those issues, if they get identified, the smaller ones can be fixed in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a simpler process. But the large ones, they get addressed in these so-called projects, which is when a bunch of people sit down and say, okay, so we have this problem. Let's propose a project within the OpenJDK community and let's get together some people let's get together the people who are involved in this specific these specific parts of the java ecosystem or java technology sphere that we're touching like maybe the, the compiler is involved with the language feature or um you know the, the garbage collection stuff is involved so let's uh, get sign off from these people that the project that we're proposing actually makes sense it actually tackles a real existing problem and that um, we can then start to work out what the exact issue is Usually there's like, um, there's like early prototypes and then over time it gets refined to something that has more of a clearer uh, structure and then at some point specific proposals come out of that. And those are usually JDK, which is the Java Development Kit, JDK Enhancement Proposals, JPs or JEPs for short. So these JEPs are basically the end result of this pro process, which is well we identified these issues and we came up with this specific solution to these issues let's see whether we can enhance the JDK uh, with this proposal. And if they get passed, if, they, if, they're, <clears throat> if they're, they're fit for, for the, for the, um, to tackle the, the issue that they describe, then eventually the change will be made. The process, the Java community uh, process changes the standard in accordance, the OpenJDK code base changes to implement that. And so these two things go, go in lockstep. Now, what that means as well is we talk about these projects and Amber, Loom, Panama and Valhalla are four of these projects and four very important and very big ones. By its nature, that means we're talking about stuff that's new. We're talking about specific issues that the Java platform has, which are not always obvious or always easy to understand. And then we're talking about often, I'm not sure like whether complex is the best word, maybe complicated, but like it's not trivial, right? These are not trivial quick fixes to a trivial issue. So by this very nature, what I'm talking about here is not uh, something that's like a basic Java uh, entry level conversation. Right? It's, not, it's not about this is the basics that you need to know about Java. This is far on the other side of the spectrum. This is if you're already a seasoned Java developer, let me tell you about some of the problems that you've come up against in your own work. 
Let me explain where they come from. And now let's see what a proposed solution is. And I'm saying all of this uh, because if you're new to Java, then you might not get all of what I'm saying. And that's perfectly fine. You're not doing anything wrong. It's just the nature of this specific talk. Um, even if you are seasoned Java developers, there might some things be unclear. Maybe I didn't put them in the right words. Maybe, you know, there's some miscommunication. So I'm not sure how we're set up for that, but I do appreciate questions. You can put them into chat. Maybe Scott can see them and, and flag me down. So I'm always open to questions. And if it doesn't work here, I'll give you a bunch of ways to reach me later so that you can always reach out and ask. And that also works for, uh, you know, like simpler questions. Um, so also stuff that's unrelated to the talk. Like if it's about Java in general, I'm always up. Uh, to tackle those things and answer. Okay, that was like a super long prelude. So let's go into these um, four projects, Amber, Panama, and Valhalla, and Loom that we want to talk about. And the slides are online at slides.nepathx.dev. Not exactly this version of them, but a version that looks mostly similar. You will see the talk Java next on the right-hand side if you go to this link. Okay, so you can follow along if you want to. So without further ado, let's fi let finally get started. We're going to start with Project Amber. So Project Amber has the goal to, to uh, bring smaller productivity-oriented Java language features into the language. And there are a bunch of links here to the project, to the wiki, to the mailing list. Um, the project launched in March 2017. It's led by Brian Getz. Um, and the basic idea is that it wants to tackle some specific downsides of Java, the language. So Java sometimes can be a little bit cumbersome. In certain situations, it lacks a certain uh, amount of expressiveness, and that is usually made up with just writing more boilerplate code. And that's not a great situation. It's not terrible, but it's also not great. And Amber wants to improve that. But Amber does not do that, which like, this is a single problem. Let's have a single solution to that, because that's not how this works. If you want to uh, improve the language, you need like a, like some like long-term goals that you want to work towards. But you also need basically come up against one problem, try to work on it, fix it, and then you'll probably find another one. So Amber is not so much a specific solution to a specific problem. It's more like a solution factory, if you will, uh, to a series of issues that it's identifying over time. So Amber does not have a specific endpoint. Most of the other four pro three projects I'm going to present, they have some specific endpoint. Once they reach that, they're done. Amber will probably keep chugging along for quite some time. And it's already done a lot of stuff, right? So if you ever see the circle numbers on my slides, they mean that is the version that this feature got finalized in. Um, and you can see here that there's also like, what is it, like six things that are already done since between Java 10 and Java 17. So each of these releases, by the way, six months apart. So from Java 10 to Java 17, that's three and a half years. And a bunch of stuff got already delivered. And you can reorder this a bit and say that the main thrust on what Amber is working right now is pattern matching. Sealed types play a role there, a very important one. Records have their own benefits, but they also play a role here. Type pattern matching, switch expressions, they all play into pattern matching. And if you're interested in where Java is going, a lot of the cutting edge talks you can see at conferences, they talk about pattern matching, uh, which to me means if many people are, bored, are already talking about it, like my job is done. Let's move on to something else. So uh, I will not present on this in this talk. Um, if you're interested in that, I recommend to watch this very YouTube video, Data Oriented Programming. Uh, it's one of those uh, presumably funny videos that I made. Um, I'm trying to put some humor in there. I'm always happy to hear that it works. Um, so watch that one. It will talk a little bit about data-oriented programming, what it is and what it means for object-oriented programming, and how these pattern matching and related features work together. Can I, can I just jump in and say, if you haven't used those features, they can save so much time in boilerplate. Like they can remove so much extra code that you don't need and allow you to focus on the code that you actually care about. They're, they've, they've been, the ones that have already been released have been extremely helpful. Yeah, and that's exactly like, so um the boilerplate reduction is like the obvious thing that they that they do and that's like a big chunk of the benefit but it's important to understand this is not the immediate goal this is often the, the, these features often created in a way that basically the boilerplate reduction is like a side of benefit because what instead is happening is the language gets a new way to express a certain thing so records for example in the record you express what i need as a carrier of data that does not have encapsulation and then the boilerplate reduction comes as a side benefit of that of course an intended side benefit it's not arbitrary um, but the goal is always not to just like save you a couple lines of code, but to give you a way to express something to yourself, to your colleagues, and to the compiler and to um, the language that you're using that you cannot express succinctly before. Okay, so one of those things actually is string composition. So let's talk a little bit about string composition. Uh, if you do that in Java, like right here, I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm creating a select statement, and I want to add in some, uh, some values, right? So I want to add in the, the, the last name here. Uh, from the property field. And then I want to add in dough here from the value, sorry, variable, not a field. 
And there's two ways to do that. Well, there's more actually, but these two ways are just use the plus operator. Or alternatively, you can use these placeholders and then use the string formatting. And this is okay, it does its job. We've been using this for 27 years. It's apparently uh, fit for purpose, uh, but it's also like somewhat indirect and it's annoying to do. And also it comes with a free SQL injection. So uh, what that means is if you actually do create strings like this, that you want then send to the database, you're setting yourself up to somebody with a weird name, like Bobby Tables, for example, to your database. If you understood that reference, you're probably old. If you're not, look up Bobby Tables, it's worth it. Um, Okay, so why don't we do something like this, which is what other languages do. You have some kind of special syntax. I use the backslash curly brace here, which is not common in other languages, but has the advantage that Java doesn't use it yet. So it's an illegal escape sequence at the moment. There's no code out there that has this, and no legal Java code that is, which means that um, there's, this is not changing behavior of something, somebody's code if you just introduce this to have a special meaning. And the special meaning here is, after this backslash curly brace, what starts is a variable name or even whole expression, but let's stick with a variable name for now. And so you just embed that. And that way you just get your string put together really fast, which also means you get your other action so much easier, which is like, this is something that Java is trying to avoid, to give you, give you a tool that makes things easier and less boilerplate-y, but you just make possibly the wrong decision faster. So let's talk a little bit about string interpolation. When we put strings together, we're usually not talking about strings they want to present to a user. Yes, you might want to put strings together for a UI or for error messages or you know, for something like that, but mostly you're creating uh, structured text that other systems need to read, HTML, XML, JSON, YAML, whatever, and uh, SQL, as we just saw. And all of those need validation and sanitization, and they all follow format-specific rules. And it would be nice if, if you put together a JSON string, you could actually validate that's a valid JSON string and that it doesn't do things that it's not supposed to. But at the same time, putting all of these rules for all of these uh, structured text languages into the uh, JDK is probably not a great idea. So this is where string templates come in. Uh, there's a JEP draft for that now that I'm linking to here. Um, one very important thing is that I'm now using text blocks here, which is a new feature since Java 15. You can start like three quotation marks and then a new line and then can use a string that goes across several lines. If you've used like Python or JavaScript, you know all of this. Um, this is not this, you don't have to use um, text blocks with this feature that I'm describing now. It just makes more sense for the specific example that I picked. String templating will work with the simple strings that I showed earlier and with the text blocks that I show here, right? So that's unrelated. It's not about the three quotation marks. It's about using this, um, using this, uh, this placeholder uh, way to put this together. So we're seeing two things here. So first of all, is these embedded expressions that at this point are only variables. And what they create is actually a templated string. So this is an instance of templated string. It's not a string immediately, it's something else. And to turn that something else into an actual string, what you need is a template processor. And that's a very important interaction that happens here uh, that in typical Java fashion will be very powerful but we'll also add a few more characters that some people will be like, oh no, I don't have to type these in other languages. Anyway, um, good. So uh, we have two things, the templated string and we have the template processor. So let's have a look at the template processor. So uh, one, of the, one of the proposed uh, instances that would be in, uh, implemented in the JDK itself would be a templated processor that simply creates a concatenated string. It does nothing fancy. You just say here, Dollar, uh, sorry, backslash curly brace desk, which reference a variable called desk, presumably description somewhere up there, and a price and a quantity and all of that. And what you get is like simple concatenated string, nothing special. It's a little bit weird, right? You're supposed to pay like what, 18 cents and six tenths of a cent, which is kind of troublesome to do in real life. So why not have another templating template processor called FMTR? Because apparently letters are expensive. I'm not convinced of this, but anyway, so it's called, it's short for formatter. So this formatter processor will understand these formatting strings. Uh, I always have to look them up. I can't do those by heart. But what this, for example, means is uh, I want to have five digits and a decimal point and two digits after the decimal point. So that's what this is. It's one, two, three, four, five digits. And there you go. Um, uh, yeah, so th this, this specific formatter would understand these templating strings and then would turn this into something that has actually only two decimal points and there's a rounding involved there. Okay, so that's easy enough. So the idea is, okay, I can have different template processors and they create different results. Simple. Let's step, take a step back and wonder why are we creating strings? 
Uh, I mentioned earlier that often we're creating strings not for other people, but for other systems. So why do we start with a string and some values? And then we basically would validate and sanitize it and create something that is just a string, which is probably one of the dumbest data structures that we have besides like integer and, and float. And then later we parse it into a statement or a JSON object. So why do we first go from a separation of variables and string to the simpler version of a string and then basically then have to parse it again? Why the detour? And the answer is no reason. We shouldn't do the detour. This is the template processor interface. This is the interface that something has to implement to qualify as a template processor. And the cool thing here is this the template processor is generic in the type of result it creates. So a template processor takes a templated string, that's the result of this, you know, this expression of this uh, string expression that has these uh, values embedded, but it can turn any kind of result. It doesn't have to return a string at all. It can return a string, but it doesn't have to. For example, it can create an SQL statement. So this would be the java.sql.statement class that I'm referencing here. And how do I get this? Well, I do what I did before. I just use a templated, I can just create a templated string by embedding the property and the value here, but I'm going to use the SQL um, processor. And the SQL processor is going to uh, take this apart. It knows it's supposed to parse SQL. So it knows it can apply all the rules that go in here. It can make sure that there's no, uh, you know, nobody's es escaping from any, um, uh, from these uh, quotation marks, it can make sure there's no injection tag, it can you know, make sure that it's an actual valid SQL statement, if not, it throws an exception, it can do all of that, and then it gives me back an actual statement, instead of a string that I then have to parse again. You can come up with the same thing for like a JSON object, for example. And this is really great, like this is small indirection of separating um, the, the templating from, the pro from processing the templating gives um, us a really powerful way to turn strings into much more interesting objects than just into other um, other lame strings. And this makes it not just uh, more powerful in the sense that you have to write less code, it makes it potentially more performant because you've already parsed the statement now. You can use the parse statement and work from that. But most importantly, it just makes it safer. It makes sure that when you want to create a statement, you actually get a valid statement out of it and not something that's, like, that's a broken statement. Uh, so that's pretty good. It's not the only thing that uh, Amber is working on, um, template strings. Oh, I just, I already, it's a JEP draft. I didn't update that slide. I was wondering about that when I said that. It's, it's, uh, the JEP is out of draft. It's JEP 430 at this point. And we can like cross fingers and hope that maybe we'll see that soon. Uh, the other endeavor is the project Amber is having. It wants to finish pattern matching. There's a JEP for that. That's in its third preview in Java 19 at the moment. So we can hope that also in the, in the next year, it will come out of preview and be finalized. It will add more patterns than just the type patterns and that we have. We've already seen that in JEP 4 and 5, which added, which added record patterns as a preview to Java 19. And there's more talk about different patterns on the mailing list as well. There is a concept of concise method bodies, whatever that is. I'll leave you to read the JEP draft if that sounds interesting to you. And then there's the whole idea to just recreate how the whole serialization story works. And there is something here, I call it a white paper, that is even before a JEP, right? So as I said, this these projects like Amber, they will at some point produce a JEP, but there's a phase before that, of course, and that phase maybe starts with an idea in somebody's head and some whiteboard drawings and some discussions, and then maybe the discussions come out to the mailing list, and then they're going back and forth there, and often somebody sits down and basically writes like a mission statement and uh, writes up some, you know, some research into other languages solutions to this. This is what usually ends up being the white paper, and then later it turns into a JEP draft and then into a JEP. So if you hear people saying that Java develops slowly, this is the reason, because people take their time to look into this very closely and research it and make the decision what is the most important thing that we can work on right now. And while there are many good ideas, many valid ideas, uh, there's like a real shortage of how many they can, they can be worked on at the same time. So even good ideas might just not be implemented, not because they're not good, but maybe because they're not important enough at this moment. Okay, so Project Emma wants to make Java more expressive, it wants to reduce the amount of code that we write and wants to make us more productive, all around good things in my book. Now, people usually ask, when will all these things happen? And I do work for Oracle, but these are my personal guesses. It's a very important distinction. Don't sue me if this doesn't come to, uh, this doesn't come to reality. Uh, so I could ask the people working on this what their guesses are, but either they give me the usual answer, it's published when it's done, which they probably would. Or if they would give me some inside information that they are not willing to share, then I couldn't share it either. That's boring. So I'm not going to ask. Right? So I don't know. Like I make these guesses based on the same information that you can have based on the mailing list and some experience for how long these things take. I could be off, way off actually. But you know, in the past, I've been decently okay with my guesses. 
Okay, so I think in JDK 19, as I said, we saw the deconstruction patterns preview. That's a fact, that's not a guess. And I think in 2023, we'll see that the patterns and switch will get finalized. I'm pretty sure that template strings will preview. And in 2024, I guess the latest, we'll see more patterns preview. Also, Amber has been really good with just coming out of surprise, coming up with surprises out of left field. The whole templating story that I just told you, that popped up last year and I've never heard of it before, I think. I'm pretty sure I didn't. So, you know, sometimes these things are being worked on without me noticing, with other people noticing, and then they just pop up. So I'm pretty sure Amber is good for a surprise here as well. That's what I'm saying. If you want to follow up, uh, there's a bunch of links here that you can also see in the slides that are online uh, to talks or videos and articles on all of these topics. Okay. If there are no questions in the audience, I would go to Project Panama. Good. I think I think uh, Neha had. Let me just see. Did you, did I don't, did Neha? You had a question. Um, is she not on the Zoom? Uh, is array pattern is I don't when, I don't know when the date on this was or time on it was, but is array pattern coming in the next version of pattern matching? Um, no. So uh, array pattern. So there was a, a rec uh, there was a proposal that targeted record patterns, which means taking records apart into their components. And array patterns will do the same to arrays, right? You can say, like, if I have an array of length two, immediately give me the first two values in, 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 a, in, in without me having to say variable one is like array at position zero and all that stuff. And so it's, they seem similar. But there were some issues with how array patterns would pan out. So instead of you know, doing both at the same time, uh, JDK 19 just contains the preview for record patterns. I'm pretty sure array patterns are still on the desk. They will, I'm pretty sure they will show up. I'm not sure when, though. Like this is what I say, like, I don't, I don't have any specific information, but judging from the fact that this was a plan and then they disappeared, this tells me that there is some issue there that needs to be worked out. Okay. Um, and so that could take a while. That sometimes happens, that it takes a while to then. Uh, to, to Barry and Mike, is there anybody in the room who has questions? I guess no answer is no, so we can move on. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Okay, so let's talk about Panama. What's Panama all about? It's about interconnecting JVM and native code. So the JVM is running Java bytecode. That could be, you know, Java source code that's compiled to this intermediate representation, the Java bytecode. But it could also be tons of other languages that run on top of the JVM. And that's really one of the strengths of the Java ecosystem, that uh, it doesn't have to be just the Java language. And the interesting thing here is that while the Java language has always been somewhat conservative in its approach to adopting features, uh, the JVM or the runtimes more generally has been on the opposite end of this. The, the runtime has off been very forward, right? Like everything is an object, for example, is something that was not easy to convince people of is a good idea in 1995. Um, garbage collection, for example, as well. So uh, the runtime has always been very progressive where the language is more conservative. And other languages that want to be progressive, uh, they can build on top of that progressive runtime. And that's something that we've seen, for example, with Scala, who went, or Clojure, maybe even more so, who went very far away into one direction. Um, to come up with something uh, something different that also runs on the JVM. So that's the JVM part of this. And then there's the native code, which is mostly predominantly C, C++ code, because that's like system libraries, that's like high high performance libraries, maybe for, for, for machine learning, for example, for image recognition, all that kind of stuff. A lot of that good stuff is implemented in C. And the reason why Python is used so much is not because Python can do these things particularly fast, it can't, but because it's easier to interact with native code and also Python is a really large ecosystem of uh, visualization, which helps a lot in, in, in dealing with data, when dealing with machine learning. Uh, that's really helpful too. So um, Python, like, this, like, like the TensorFlow is not implemented in Python. It just gives you a nice Python uh, surface to implement against. Um, and so this, and this is much tougher with Java at the moment, like creating, like interacting with native code in Java is not fun. I'm going to come to that in a second. So the idea here is that you have just like the two oceans of the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean, you have the JVM on the one side and the native code on the other side, and you want to connect those. And Project Panama is like the Panama Canal is going to connect these two, hence the name. Uh, it was launched in July 2014. At the moment, it's led by Moritz Chimada Mora. And it, uh, it falls apart into three different uh, sub-projects, the Vector API, and then the Foreign Memory, and the Foreign Function API. The last two, they collaborate. The first one is something totally different. Let's start with the Vector API. Um, the vector API is a very interesting thing that I really like to learn about. Uh, so let's let's see the simple computation. What I'm doing here is I have three arrays, A, B, and C. 
And what I want to do is I want to pull out a number out of A and a number out of B, square both, add them up, take the negative, and that's my result for C. And then I want to do that, you know, for, the, for all the arrays, for all the values in the array. So it's like I wrote the, uh, the code down there. It's very straightforward. Iterate over the list, uh, sorry, over the arrays, get out the elements, do the math, and put them into C. Now, um, what happens here, like this implementation is fine and it works, but there's some performance gain to be had. So modern CPUs, and by modern, I mean basically things that came in the 90s or after. I think MMX on Intel was one of the first extensions that popularized this. Um, what they have is so-called multi-word registers, which is a register of, let's say, 512 bits, like in this Lenovo la laptop. I think my Ryzen at home is 256 bits of multi-word registers. So that means it's a register that cannot contain just one float, but if it's 512 bits, that would be, what, eight floats. Um, or 16, sorry, 16 floats, right. So a multi-word register can store multiple of those. And then uh, you, have, uh, you have operations on them that can do a computation of multiple of these, um, of these words together. So that means, for example, instead of adding two registers to one result, you can add two of these multi-word registers, which contain, let's say, 16 floats each, to 16 results. And it basically takes the same time. That's a potential 16 times speed up. Instead of creating one result each CPU cycle, roughly speaking, you can create 16 results each CPU cycle. And if you think about how addition works, for example, it's super simple. Just cut off the carry bit at some, after some number of bits, and you get this. So this is impressive, right? This is a big speed up, and it's important, for example, in coding and decoding and, and image processing, any, anything that uses math heavily, machine learning as well, for example. It's called SIMD, single instruction multiple data, because you have multiple data in the form of like uh, 16 pairs of floats and a single instruction at them or multiply or whatever. And the, the Java just in time compiler with, is the machinery that takes the bytecode because executing bytecode is really slow. So when the, the, the running JVM notices that they use the same, you execute the same code again and again, it figures out that this seems to be important code, which it calls hot code. And then says, look, let's recompile this to native code in the background. So while, while the bytecode machinery, like basically in, like slowly works through your instructions, some part of the JVM splits off, goes into its own room, takes the same bytecode, compiles it to native code that is optimized for your machine, and then comes back and replaces it. So, and that's a really cool feature on its own. So the run runtime will then just say, okay, instead of doing the whole bytecode machinery, which is slow, let's execute this in native code. And then, you know, the just in time compiler actually can escalate this and realize that, oh, it's, it's even like the code is even hotter, like it's used even more. Now I'm going to spend really a lot of time. I gathered a bunch of information about which branches went which way and how the loops were used and all of that. I'm going to use that to compile it even more uh, and give you even, uh, even a more optimized native code. And that just in time compiler knows about these vector instructions and it can try to create to use them. It can figure out that the loop you've written actually does map onto these vector instructions and then it can try to make that work and it can try to give you that let's say 16 fold speed up the thing is it's great when you get the performance boost for free but you can't rely on it if your system really needs that performance boost it's not great because a simple refactoring of a loop can make it so that the compiler can no longer prove to itself that turning it into bit or into vector operations is actually correct and then it can't do the optimization and a simple refactoring might you know tank your performance for example which is not great so the vector API came, comes in and says, we're going to try to make this reliable. And this is the same loop as before in the vector API. You can see it's, you know, it's a little bit more cumbersome. There's a little more stuff involved. I'm not going to go over the details. The important part is that this is the loop here. And what I'm doing here is I'm saying, look, I'm going to have this vector A, which I'm going to pull from the array A. Uh, and then I have the vector B, which I'm going to pull from the array B. And now I have two vectors, and now I'm going to do the whole writing math as method calls, which everybody hates, which is A times A and B times B, and then we add that up, and then we take the negative, and then we write the result into the C array. And this array does not, this loop does not go in steps of length one, it goes in steps in length of the number of steps that the vector array has on your machine. So you write this code in this more abstract way. And then it can always compile down to the most optimal solution, um, depending on the hardware you're running on. So the API is comparatively clear and concise, but specifically given the requirements, which are not like to make this work reliably, you have to jump through some hoops and it does that really well. 
it's platform agnostic. Um, so even if, for example, the vector API is not yet uh, implemented for that specific hardware, li hardware library, it will still work, works on all the platforms. And it has grace for degradation in the sense that you will never get code that is worse than the loop code, right? Than the simple loop code. But you will on supported platforms, which are a lot of them uh, at the moment, you will get something like all those um, operating system and big CPU, infra um, infra CPU architectures are supported. You will get reliable runtime compilation and performance. They will reliably hit these multi-word registers and the SIMD instructions, and you get up, um, you get a, a considerable performance boost. And that's really cool. That's something that for everybody who does, as I said, image processing, machine learning, all of that, that's a big step in the right direction because now you can take these libraries that have been implemented in C and you can actually give it a try to implement them in Java um, without um, um, getting uh, worse performance. Okay, so that puts the vector API behind us. And now we're going to do foreign APIs, which is a totally different beast. And I don't want to spend too much time on it because it's not my favorite topic anyway. I'm not I don't do C and C++ because it's always has always been annoying me. So I'm, <laughs> I've not looked into that a lot. Uh, so I want to cut this a little bit short on the foreign APIs. What I'm basically t talking about is two different things. It's uh, taking stuff that usually the, say, taking data that usually um, the garbage collector manages and put it off heap, meaning you put it off the pile of data that, uh, off the pile of, pile of memory that the um, garbage collector manages. And you put it in a different part of the memory that you manage yourself. You want to do that, for example, if you want to call a C library that, you know, does some machine learning magic, for example, you will first you want to put the data at somewhere where the garbage collector doesn't move it around. Then you want to tell the C library to work on it. And then you put the result back into the heap to keep working on it in Java. And that process uh, is not working great in Java at the moment. It works, but it's not working great. And then the process that actually lets you call this C function, the C library, also not working great. It's very tedious includes a bunch of different tool chains that not always interact really well. And so the two different APIs come in to make that better. And the form, both of them actually have a similar approach. Uh, the old solutions that exist were somewhat oversimplified. They try to tackle a complex problem by, you know, breaking it down into a simple API, and that doesn't always work. Sometimes a complex problem needs a somewhat complex solution so that you can, like, turn all the dials that you need. So the form memory API contains a little bit more code than also a little bit more API surface than just the old byte buffer, for example. You get a bunch of different classes where you can have managed memory segments and memory addresses. A memory session is very interesting because you can use that to intentionally deallocate this memory, which was not possible before. You can make sure that you only pay for uh, um, for correct parallel access because you know making sure that parallel access work correct is a performance hindrance. Uh, you only need to pay that performance price if you actually want to do that. And if you don't want to use your off heap memory in parallel, then you can just like throw away all the guardrails and go ahead and get better performance. Just don't use it in parallel then in different threads. The foreign function API similarly uh, takes a very low level approach to creating, uh, to interacting with the C library, which is uh, faster and safer than the approach we have now, but it would require some uncomfortable, uh, you know, coding. So that's something that a tool, a new tool called JExtract, will do for you. It will take a C file and recreate this very low-level Java file. And then you're going to create your good API on top of that low-level Java API. And the good part about that is if you, if you get an update for the C library, you run JExtract again, you get an updated version of that low-level Java file. And then you're, if, if the C library changed in, you know, in certain ways that are not backwards compatible, like maybe they change a return type or new, or, you know, got new method, uh, sorry, function got a new input, then the generated Java code will change. But the code that you wrote against that file now doesn't compile anymore because maybe you're calling a function that has a different return value. And it's great because that means you can update the C library, rerun J extract, and then have the compiler point out all the places uh, where, the, where the API changed. And this is one of the reasons why Java is not that strong in the native field. Is because the old process was much, was much more cumbersome, and so many projects had like relied on old, older versions of the C libraries because updating them all the time was a bit of a pain for those often um, open source projects that are being worked by uh, worked on by people who do this in their free time. And JXtract is supposed to make that much uh, much simpler, much more reliable. So the timelines is this time. I'm not guessing. The foreign function and foreign memory API have been incubating for a while separately, and now they're put together into the right package. They're a preview feature now in Java 19, and they're already pretty mature, pretty mature. So I'm expecting them to be finalized maybe next year. But at this moment, they're both in preview. And now the vector API, that one is also pretty mature, 
it would already be finalized probably were it not for the fact that it needs some features on Project Valhalla to make its API better and more powerful. And it would be a shame to now finalize the API and then not being able to change it anymore, right? Because we have a standard that we cannot just simply change. We don't want to change it backwards in a compatible manner. So um, once the vector API gets basically set in stone, you can't just go in like, oh, we have new language features. Let's change how this works to make it more performant or more usable because that will then uh, break existing code. So that's not something that Java does. And that means that um, it either gets a suboptimal API now or it waits for, I'm not sure how long, until Valhalla comes around. And it, it's, it's, it's doing that. So Vector API is probably going to wait until Valhalla comes around with, with the features that it needs. If you're interested in deep, deeper dives, there's a bunch of stuff on the Vector API here. There's a great article by uh, Gunnar Morling, who wrote on his blog, uh, Fizzbuzz, in Cindy style, uh, which Fizzbuzz is not a problem that, you know, vectorizes particularly well. So I had to jump through some hoops and learn the API really well. And it's a very entertaining article. I can only recommend that. And if you're more interested in foreign APIs, that's a bunch of articles and videos here. Um, the OpenJDK doesn't have, the community doesn't really have strict guidelines on how to, what artifacts to create. But many of the project leads adopted this idea of creating state of XYZ documents. And when you can, ever, when you can see them and you can, when you can spot them for the project that you're interested in, those should always be the first thing you, you read. The state of foreign memory support and state of foreign function support, are, these are like basically the white papers that all the other stuff builds on. This is, that's the problem statement. This is what maybe other languages do if it applies. This is what we've researched in the alternatives and we come up with this solution for this and that reason. Uh, it's just a great, and they're often written in a way that makes it easy to understand them if you know Java somewhat well. Uh, so for example, I don't know native code very well. So this uh, state of foreign function support is not very clear to me. Um, but if you do, then I think it's, it's a very good read. And I can uh, attest to that from the other state of the XYZ documents that I read. Um, yeah. With that, I would go to Project Valhalla, unless people want to test how little I really know about C and C++ by asking me questions about Panama. I think I'm going to take that as a no. So let's move on with Valhalla. Valhalla has a weird claim. It's about advanced Java VM and language feature candidates, which really tells you nothing. So let's instead talk about what the actual motivation is. Java's type system is really strongly split. It has a huge, huge chasm between two opposing, um, yeah, opposing areas. And that's primitives, int, double, float, you know those, on the one hand, and classes, on the other hand. Uh, classes always have identity, and they are always references. I'm going to explain in a second what I mean by that. But we can only create classes. So that we don't get to choose what we create. We don't get to trade off this against that. No, we can just create classes and we get all the things that it means, even if we don't want them. So what does identity mean? Um, so if you write code, which says you create a new variable, you say int foo equals five, and then you say int bar equals five. And I'm asking you, is foo and bar the same? You're like, well, I mean, they're both five. Of course they are. How can, how can they not be the same thing? They're both five. So the idea that they could be different doesn't even make sense. They have the same value, so of course they're the same. But if you write instead, for example, uh, integer foo equals new integer of five and integer, integer bar is new integer of five, then those things are not the same instance. They both have the same abstract meaning of five, but they're not the same instance. If you compare them with the equals equals operation, you will get false back. Um, you can lock on one without having locked on the other, which is a terrible idea, but you can. So these things have the same value, but they're different. And that's what identity means. Identity means that things can have the same properties, but they're still different things. Um, so yeah, so that's something that you, you often need, right? You don't want to have like two users with the same name just being the same user. No, they happen to have the same name, but they're still like different entities. Uh, but sometimes you don't want to have that if you have two you want to build a system that deals in, in mon monetary uh, monetary values and currencies, you have $5 here and $5 there, it's the same $5. There's like just no, no other way. Um, so, but we can't, don't have the choice at the moment. We always have identity. And that means there's an extra memory footprint for headers. Uh, it means that they're mutable because only things with identity can be mutable. I'm not going to go into that why that's the case, but trust me on that one. Um, and it en enables locking and synchronization some things that not all custom types need. And if you don't need this, you pay for it with the extra memory, with the chance of people mutating your state, even if you don't want to. 
And then there are also references. References mean um, that when in Java you call a, you call a method and you pass the int five, then that that's thirty two bits. That you know by IEEE standard is five, and you pass that around. It's just like the value. But if you pass something that's an integer, you don't pass the five. What you pass is a reference to the memory uh, location that has the five. And that's super important in many, many instances, right? If you pass a list to a function or to a method, you don't want to like copy the whole list and pass it to the method. And when the method adds an element to the list, it does not impact the original one. No, of course not. You want to pass the list and then the method manipulates that list. And then the instance that you have in hand reflects that, um, that change. But other, other times you don't want this, but you always pay for it. You always pay for the memory access in direction. You always have the, everything that's a reference can also be null. And everything that's a reference is also protected from tearing, another topic I'm not going to go into. But again, not all custom types need that. And so here's where Project Valhalla comes in. The idea is to unify the type system by closing that chasm and give you, giving you more choices where you can like land in between. It will give us probably, it's also in proposal phase, not even quite there yet. It will give us probably value types, which say I don't need identity. It will give us primitive types that say I don't need identity and also don't need references. And it will give us universal and specialized generics, once again, probably. So let's go over those. Let's start with value types. This is a relatively common Java class definition, uh, but it has the type, the, the keyword value here. And what that means is you're not creating a regular class, you're creating a value class. They're almost the same, except that the class and all its fields are final and you cannot have all kinds of superclasses. There's no number of superclasses is super limited, not the number, but the, the structure that they must be fulfilled is very limiting. But you can implement interfaces, you can add methods on their constructors, static factory methods, whatever you want. Like this is like a normal class, except for the uh, two rules that are wrote down there. But value types have no identity. So that means that some, some runtime operations, they can throw exceptions, something you cannot lock on something without an identity, but that's fair enough. And if you do an identity check with the two equal signs, it actually compares by state. What do you get in return? Value types are guaranteed immutable, which is great. Uh, that's, uh, that's something that in very many situations you don't want stuff to be immutable, and you don't want to write all the code that you need to write to make sure it's not immutable. No, uh, these value types will be guaranteed to be immutable. It's much more expressive. If you think about domain-driven design, a value actually has a meaning there, and it's great that we can express that meaning succinctly within Java. And also importantly, it will give the JVM more room for, improve, for, for optimizations, because it doesn't need to track the identity of an object that doesn't have identity. So it is freer to optimize stuff and give you better performance. Now, value types are still references, though. You can still use null as a default value and still protect it from tearing, which I promised I'd skip. Um, and then there are a bunch of types within the JDK that will probably become value types in the future. Now let's talk about primitive types. They work pretty much the same. Instead of value, write primitive here. But that applies different rules. So they're almost like a value class, meaning all the limitations for value classes apply. But also you cannot reference a, a field of your own types. One of those things, again, that do make sense, but I don't want to go into because it takes a little bit of time to explain. So basically, primitive classes, just like value classes, you can do a lot of things uh, with them. Primitive types, like value types, have no identity, meaning they are immutable. You get some optimizations for that, that kind of stuff, the good stuff that I just told, told you about. But also, they're not references. And that means they do not have null as the default value. Their default value is all fields set to their default. So in this case, the complex number would have as a default rational part and irrational part zero. That's a good complex number. That's the complex number zero. Makes sense for default. Now, if you go back to uh, the rational number, it had a nominator and a denominator. The default value for these would both be zero, but then you have a denominator of zero, which is an illegal number. So as soon as you do math with the default value, it immediately explodes and you get not a number, which is not great, right? The default value for integer is zero. That's a good, gets a good integer. The default value for our rational number would then be not a number, which is a really bad default value, which is probably the reason why this is not a primitive class, but a value class, because it needs to be a reference, because it needs null as a, meaning, as a default value uh, that does not just uh, obstruct all math or other operations that you do in it. So that's a trade-off. 
If you need null as a default value, if you need protection from tearing, you pick a value class. Otherwise, you pick, pick a primitive class because that's the only difference there. Okay, so the benefit you get from that is even more performance improvements to the point where uh, primitive types will behave in performance almost or in the same ballpark as today's primitives, which is, which is really good. That means you can create your own primitives and they will get the same performance as you've been using int. I'm not going to go into the whole boxes thing. Once again, that's a more like it's a little bit of a mind twister. Um, but suffice it to say that just like you have a wrapper around int that is integer, you will also have wrapper types for the primitives that you create. Okay, now let's say we understand how value types and primitive types work, and now we're using them with generics, or we want to use them with generics. At the moment, they wouldn't work. Generics don't work with primitives, so presumably they would not work with primitive types and probably also not with value types. And that would suck. Like at the moment, it's already bad enough. Sorry, that would be bad. <laughs> um, at the moment, it's already bad enough that uh, that primitives do not work with generics. It's acceptable because primitives are not really like very expressive types. There's not that many reasons to actually have a list of long, so we can kind of live with it that we can't do that. But it would be really bad if all the all the domain types that we create that can now be value types and primitive types immediately stop working when you touch generics. So instead of being in that situation, the idea is okay. Let's the idea of universal generics is to expand where generics work and basically accept primitives as well as value types and primitive types as um, generic type parameters. Only on the compiler, like only on the compiler level, the compiler will accept them, but it will still it will still generate the bad kind of like object array backed code that you get at the moment with generics. Like the whole erasure thing is still in play. The big chunk of this project Valhalla, I would guess like half the effort of all of Valhalla is this specialized generics. I mean, the half part is my guess, but I think I don't think it's very far off. This is a huge change. The idea here is that not only will you be able to say I want to have a list of int, for example, an array list of int, what you also want to have is that the array list of int is not backed by an object array, but by an actual int array. So the compiler has to figure out that using uh, this, this generic type is a primitive type. And it can then, instead of, you know, creating an array of references, it can create an array of these embedded primitive types. And, uh, there's a lot of work going in here, in here. And I think like this will probably take the longest, but that's also a very important part because that gives you the, the universal generics mean you can express what you want to express, but you're still going to dunk your, tank, tank your performance, uh, in the sense that all the performance benefits you get from primitive types like are heavily reduced if you put them into generics, which is not great because generics are a great way to program. And so with specialized generics, that trade-off would go away. So speaking of trade-offs, overall, the goal of Project Valhalla is to give us these value and primitive types, universal and specialized generics, to have fewer trade-offs between design and performance. So you don't have to write the code, so you don't write, end up writing code that you like and you think is well-designed and well-maintainable, and then you realize the performance isn't good, and now you have to sacrifice design for performance. Now that said, it's a super common mistake to start this trade-off way too early. Like it's super common for developers to look at code and be like, ah, that doesn't look performant. Let me rewrite that and let me create something much uglier that surely is more performant without measuring, without making sure that this code even needs to be optimized. Uh, like there's this 80-20 rule, right? That you can get 80% of the results with 20% of the effort. Um, I think in performance work, it's even more extreme. Like if you just randomly start optimizing code in your code base, you have a very, very high chance that you don't change anything in the actual resulting performance because most of the time is spent in very little code. And if you don't find that code and optimize that piece of code, you're, not, you're, just, you're just wasting everybody's time, first of all, your own by optimizing something. And then second of all, everybody has to touch their code in the future. So it's really important that what you need to do as a zeroth step when you optimize is figure out what actually your goal is like what what thing should get better and then the next step the first step is to actually measure and find out okay so i want to have latency x what is my latency and then you start to analyze and figure okay so latency is too high and then where does the where's the time spent and then you find the code that spends the most time and you realize oh that's a database call like maybe can't do anything much here 
let's go searching. Oh, this, this is weird. This loop takes a lot of time. It shouldn't. So let's look into that loop. And that's how you find the piece of code that you want to optimize. And so in design and performance, it's much less prevalent than many people think. But that doesn't mean it's not, it doesn't exist. It does exist. Everybody who creates games, for example, knows that. Specifically, like games on Android, uh, which is a super limited system where um, any garbage collection pause can like, cause you like you know dozens of frames to not be computed, and then you know destroys the gaming gaming experience of your of your game. It's not just games, but that's one specific example. So anyway, so the idea is that Project Valhalla will create reduce those trade-offs. Um, it will make manual specializations redundant, uh, which is something like in-stream and float stream. It will give us all better performance because the JDK and the libraries we use can start using value types and primitive types without maybe us even noticing, and they will get the performance benefits. And you can express your design more clearly, and if we more often do not communicate in mutable, uh, so we communicate with mutable objects that we pass around between subsystems, but with immutable objects, uh, it will reduce the shared state and shared state as the root of all evil. Um, that would mean that you can probably write more reliable code. It overall makes Java more expressive and more performant at the same time, which is pretty good. Now, this, these timeline guesses are super vague. Uh, I'm like, this is the most uh, questionable of my guesses. So I hope to see value classes next year. And I presume that primitive classes follow on follow closely behind that. And I think that universal generics as well, because like having primitive and value types, but not being able to use them generics is weird. But I do think that specialized generics are still a way off. Once again, no idea whether this is true with my personal guesses. Maybe Brian Getz who works on this surprises at all and he's done next year. Maybe he's not and we don't see anything next year and it takes until 2024 and 25 before we start seeing the first features. I really don't know. It's very vague at this point to me. State of Valhalla are amazing documents. The first two, I think any, any, anybody who's written Java code for like a year or two can understand these first two. Uh, and they're really good. Like they go so much, explain so much the conservation behind these uh, of what I just told you. And then the third part is how to implement that within JVM. Yeah, and I'm getting lost there. Can't really, can't really say I missed that one. Okay, let's take a breather. Let's do a little bit of an ad break here, because the open the, uh, because OpenJDK does more than just these big projects. There's a lot of small API improvements happening all the time. Uh, the IPRI address resolution got a new uh, um, SPI. When number generation got spruced up a lot, you can now use Unix domain sockets and all kinds of like classes, like workhorse classes, like string and stream. They get all kinds of improvements all the time. And then there's internal refactorings that just makes the JDK more more uh, more performance, safer, fixes bugs, adds security issues, and so on. We'll come back to security in a second, by the way. Um, there's continuous improvements in the usability, for example. We now use UTF-8 by default. We have a simple web server. Actually, it's running this presentation. So this presentation um, is running in a browser, and it needs a web server. And the web server that I'm using is the Java web server, which is included since JDK 18. You get more information on null pointer exception, and overall tooling improves. JFR can now help you scrub. Oh, wait, that's not a seven. That's not a 14, I think. I think that's the wrong number. I think it's an 18. Um, so it can now help you uh, scrub uh, important, uh, so user, user sensitive data from, from the JFR logs. Uh, you, can have, you can compile code that you show in your documentation. So you can make sure that your documentation actually shows working code and not just you know, code that you wrote in a text file. Um, there's a packaging tool there. JFI event streaming means you can connect to a different machine. And JFI is Java Flight Recorder, by the way. It, it makes Java one of the most transparent pieces of software that you can run because you can observe it on such a detailed level that you can basically, um, you can figure out so many things that are not, not working right in your running application because of that. Either be bugs, security issues, performance issues specifically, you can find out so much with that. And JFR, JFR event streaming means you can connect to a different JVM that runs elsewhere and take a look at what's going on there. Performance improvements happen all the time, uh, like just general small short level like improvements of garbage collection specifically but also there's class data sharing which got uh, updates in 12 13 and 19 and if you're interested in the launch at launch performance of your app i can recommend you take a look at that already mentioned security a little bit there are specific features like uh, new signature algorithms but also a serial deserialization filter there's a general deserialization filter added in java 9 and a context specific one in 17 and what they do is they help you like if you have 
um, deserialization endpoints open to the internet or to the intranet even that's it's like it's not like from performance from a security point of view that's at least a yellow flag but the deserialization filter can help you deal with that um, overall there's ongoing enhancements all the time i can highly recommend sean marlon's blog uh, sean marlon is the head of uh, OpenJDK security he's working for oracle and he has a blog where he writes like clockwork a blog post every six months and it's always about all the updates that have been that have been made regarding security in the recent uh, JDK release, and that's like a treasure trove of information uh, if you're interested in, uh, in that. We're not only adding stuff; we're also removing stuff. Uh, for the first time in Java's history, we're slowly and well, not we. I work for Oracle, but I don't do any of this work. Right? I just talk about it. So let's say the the Java platform Google Oracle and the Open JDK community uh, in general um is starting to remove stuff that is not needed anymore just because it holds java back to constantly keep doing this specifically finalization security manager those are features that do have some value but uh, they add a lot of baggage to the library sorry to the jdk itself but also to people using it and the cost benefit analysis just doesn't pan out so these things are getting deprecated for removal which means that eventually uh you know get kicked out and a few things were already removed so NASA, for example, the Java, JavaScript runtime was removed in Java 15, although it is a standalone project as far as I know, so you can still like drag it in as a dependency if you need to. I was, supposed, I was planning to talk a little bit about how you can prepare your own migrations, but I'm going to skip past that. If you're interested in that, you can just ask a question. I'll go back to the slide. But for now, uh, let's keep going. This is the point where I usually ask the audience what Java version they're on, and then by a show of hands, I, you know, basically try to come up, uh, I have a few ideas here, and they mostly pan out. So I don't even have to ask you, I actually know what you would raise your hands to mostly. <laughs> what we'll see is that uh, Java 11 is, a, is in most audiences that I ask, has a wider share than Java 8, which is great, because Java 8 is a great release to be on, but it's also at this point pretty dated. So seeing that people made the jump from 8 to 9, and then from 9 to 11, that's good to see. Um, people who are on 11, realize very quickly that the move to 17 is really easy. So at conferences, which is a self-selected group of people who are more interested in the JDK uh, and in updates than the average development uh, um, team maybe, they have like more people on 17 than on 11. Uh, and even, even fewer people on 8, so that's good. And then there's always like a few people who are actually on the recent release, meaning at the moment they're on 19. But that group of people is very small, and I'm trying to tell you that this group can be larger. If you go from 11 to 17, do that. Do that carefully. Notice how many issues it causes you. I will bet that for most projects out there, the number is zero. It will probably not cause you any issues, or at least not any issues that you cannot overcome uh, in, an, in, in an afternoon of figuring things out. Uh, Mike, I don't know if we, we don't have the camera turned towards the audience anymore. Uh, but if, if we wanted to turn towards the audience to do it, it's, it's up to you. Um, I, don't, I don't mind either way. It's fine. Like I would like to see the audience, but you know, but it's cool, whatever you decide. Uh, right, so um, going from 11 to 17, which is six versions, is fairly straightforward. And so doing a six of that work every six months, I think is straightforward too. Uh, and then the next LTS won't even be 17, but 21, which also makes it a little bit easier to invest into these intermediate updates. So I can only recommend to do that. Okay, last on my list is Project Loom. But I've been talking for a long time. I can keep talking about this forever. But I'm wondering whether we should, uh, you know, I open up for questions, maybe um, table loom for later, or if you want to keep me, want me to keep going. Don't mind the clock. I'm fine. I have to keep I, I, I've been following. The, there's been some discussion, but I think all the dates, all the questions have been answered. Uh, like someone asked, when will Valhalla preview? But I think that was already answered. Well, yeah. So the, the, the exact answers we don't know. The, the, like, the more guesswork answer is, I hope we'll see something next year. Uh, Mike, we can't hear. If there's a question, can you moderate the questions from the room? We have some. We have some. Scott, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Barry. Guys, can you hear us? We we Hello? can hear we can hear you in the room. Can you can you guys do you have any questions you want to moderate for 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 our speaker? Okay, can you hear us here? Yes, yeah, I can hear. Yeah. Yes. We we can hear you just fine. Yeah. I I can hear from wherever Barry is. Like wherever Barry is, I can hear. 
we have questions, but it's going to be tough because we're having some feedback. So whoever asks the questions is going to have to not listen to the feedback uh, in the room. Barry, Barry, why don't why don't you why don't you why don't Barry why don't you ask the questions for the people? Okay, you had a question earlier. Yeah, I think you're whatever Barry. Okay. So we have questions, but it's going to be tough because we're having some feedback. So whoever has questions can't be not. No, but they feel like I'm back in the room. Terry, we're going to talk. Okay. 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 But they still have that feedback loop, right? They saw that the audio is running somewhere I'm, in the background. I'm not, I'm not sure, but Barry's coming in clear, so. so um, okay. Okay. So Nikolai, I had a question about the uh, early access builds for all the projects. Um, yeah. In particular, um, Loom, uh, Valhalla, and, um, and Panama are, are available. They haven't been updated in a while, and then there there isn't one for Valhalla. Oh, no, I'm sorry. There's no one for Amber. I think you're right. There's um, not one for Valhalla. So what, I think. What's the process of getting those updated, um, you know, for, for developers to experiment? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. Um, the, the, kind, the issue with that is kind of that, um, so, so some projects decide that it makes sense for them to put together an early access build that is somewhat stable and actually lets you right. use those features right. to a degree. But uh, would you mind talking about turning on the mic off the mic for a second? Um, yes, yeah, so because of the feedback. Um, the, the, the right. Okay. So, uh, so some projects decide. I think Loom did this to decide to to put together a version of their features that works mostly and to let you experiment with them. But not all projects are in that state. So, for example, Valhalla. I think the old the review is uh, the preview is pretty old, as you said. And the question is: Is there a point in time where there is a coherent like that the, the, the implementation of Valhalla as it is in their fork is good enough to give a preview build to developers and what's the value of that and i think at the moment my like i didn't ask this but i would guess that to the people working on that project it's just not worth the effort because there's not enough like it's not settled enough right it's very like if you give someone early access build that then they cannot give you feedback on because half you already know you want to change anyway. It's like giving somebody a half written draft of a blog post to do review. Like you already know you have to change everything. So why even get the review? Uh, so what you can always do though, is you can build it yourself. It's not actually that hard to build uh, specifically on Linux systems because a lot of the stuff already lying around, uh, probably Mac OS too, I'm not sure. It's not that hard to build your own JDK. You can do it. Like if, so if people are interested, I would recommend um, if you want to really experiment with the newest version of these projects, invest into understanding how to build the JDK in your own system. Uh, you can, there's, there are guides to that, and you can start doing that with just like the regular JDK, not no Valhalla, no Panama, nothing, just the regular JDK. Learn how to build it on your machine, and once that works, just check out the Valhalla, the Valhalla uh, fork and build your own. Maybe ask on the mailing list what would be a good commit to build. Maybe look at them, maybe there are tags in there that you want to build from. Instead of instead of head, uh, but yeah, some of these some of these projects don't give you previews, um, and they made the decision I guess consciously. Uh, so I don't think that there's actually any like structured way to get them updated. You can ask on the mailing list whether maybe like you heard about this and that and you want to experiment with it. Is there a good version to to uh, to build from, or is there even somebody who has like a build running around? Uh, but yeah, OpenJDK as a whole is not extremely big on like building artifacts. Like it's focusing on the code side. I have to say. Uh, Barry, we muted you to reduce the feedback. Do you have any other questions? I think they're still catching up. Are they watching through the YouTube channel, maybe? All right. Awesome. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Do we need you to reduce the feedback? Do you have any other questions? Yeah, yes, we do have a question. Maria, what's your question? Do you, can you hear us? Yep. We can't hear you. Okay. What's Ask your question? Your question. What's the average what? Math background. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, what's the average math background of the people who worked on the vector project? 
the average math background. Yeah, so I think that was the question: is what was the math background like, and the people who worked on it? What do you mean, like, like what the what the educational background is, like the people who work on the vector API, how much they know about like like high, like university math? I believe so. Oh, uh, I have no clue. Um, I don't think that that has a particular. I mean, like, look, I studied math until I realized it's too much for me, and I started switch to computer science instead. <laughs> so I have like I adore people understand math. So like I'm I'm of the belief that knowing math really well like helps you in all strides of your life, but I think specifically for the vector API, it's not terribly important uh, because what the what the API is about is um, getting the CPU like getting the instructions that the AMD and the Intel and the ARM and those vector vector API so those SIMD instructions that they expose find a way to uh, unify them and create one API that get, allows you to, in a usable way, use these instructions and that they can then compile down to optimal code and all these different architectures. That's not a math problem. I mean, like, unless you consider all kinds of abstract thinking math. That's a problem that just like hands down hard, a hard uh, API design problem. Figuring out what these, what these, what these APIs and the CPUs offers are, how to generalize over them, how to write like the nitty gritty code that can actually turn this into optimal machine code instructions that's just like that's just really tough um, software design. Probably hardware background will surely help better understand what the performance characteristics of these different CPUs are. Um, but if that was the question, I'm, there, there's a good chance that these people do have a strong math background, uh, but I don't think it's strictly speaking required. All right. Any other questions from the room, Barry? I think we can move on then, unless they respond. Okay. Um, look, I'm going to do a speed, Project Loom speed run, and then well, I'm going to let you go. I have another question. And oh, yeah, go. You can put this off until the end of your talk, but I'd like to know if you've um, read Brian Getz's ramp up blog, and if so, what's your opinion of it? Oh, yeah, no, let's talk about that. Uh, that's a very good one, and that's actually like that. Actually, uh, is interesting to the audience probably as well. So, I mean, all those questions were, but I mean, like specific to the audience. If there are people out there, uh, and that's my understanding, who are listening, who are maybe not like already um, professional Java developers, then what you're doing when you're starting to program is what you what you want to do is you want to do see something work, right? That's something that I think like even the most senior developers in general, like software developers still enjoy, like having a situation where you have a problem and you start writing code and then it, and then it doesn't work and it doesn't work again. It keeps not working until eventually it works. I still have this now, like after doing this for like 10 years professionally and a couple more years in university, I still occasionally sit in front of my laptop like, yes, yeah, it works. That's so great. And I use swear words to be when I'm really happy too. So yeah, so I'm really like, and that, 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 that's something that's to me personally, it's an integral part of developing. And that's particularly important if you start early, because if you start like, not sorry if you start early, if you start to program. Because starting to program is, is tough, right? There's a lot of things going on that you don't understand. But as soon as something starts happening, you get like a positive feedback, like, oh, this is cool, this works actually. And that's something that programming actually is in a uniquely positive position to deliver. Like math, for example, or biology doesn't have it that way, right? You cannot just like learn a little bit about biology and then you can make a frog. Uh, so I think that's really cool about programming that it gives you this chance of just trying something out and see something work. And I think that like that feedback cycle helps you get over all the tough parts of developing. And so the issue that Java has when you start out is that it actually puts a bunch of concepts in your way that you either have to ignore or have to learn about before you can start to see results. You have to write public class, whatever the class name is, curly brace, public static void main string bracket bracket arcs and then you can start writing well, another curly brace and then you can start writing the code you actually care about and then you know heaven forbid you want to print something to the terminal you're like system dot out dot print line what even is all that so java just like gives you you know a bunch of stuff that you have to face before you get started and like like any java developer who's been working for a year or two everybody with an ide doesn't care anymore like in an ide you just type main 
you know, whatever control space enter, you get the rest of the code. You can you can write in your sleep as well. But to beginners, that's a lot of stuff. You have to know about visibility, about classes, about what static means, about what return values are, what a method even is, uh, what what the weird brackets are, and you have to learn all of that or ignore all of that before you get to start learning. And that's not a great way to start learning. Even the ignoring part is not good, um, because it like it, it, it. I think it detracts from the natural curiosity that helps you in learning. If somebody tells you like, "Look, we're going to do this thing. I know you want to learn about these five, but we're going to ignore that for now." Not helping. So long story short, Java puts a lot of concepts in your way. It would be nice if those would be fewer. So Brian Gertz recently, I'm not sure whether the proposal is even the right way. Let's say what he white what he white papered uh, is a problem description of what I just gave you, and then possible solutions. And the possible solution would be to kick out a bunch of projects out of your uh, sorry, a bunch of concepts out of your way before something starts working. So for example, um why does the main method have to be public and static it doesn't really have to be so instead of making it a static method it could be an instance method as long as the class around that has like a parameterless constructor the launcher might just as well create an instance and call main why why does it have to be public there's the concept of an unnamed package and in the unnamed package it doesn't matter what exactly that is we can actually loosen that requirement because i say like look don't learn about what visibility is at the moment you just want to write a few lines of code let's you know kick out public and then the string bracket bracket arcs, you probably don't need arguments on your first script. So let's kick that out as well. And suddenly public static void main string bracket bracket arcs becomes void main. And there you go. Much better already. Next one is uh, kick out the class wrapper around this, this method, which is a big step, actually. That, that's something that's like, that's, that's like the biggest step in here. So why do you write a class around it? That class probably just contains the word public class, class name, curly brace, curly brace. And then nothing class specific is in there, is happening in there. So let's remove that as well. And then give you some imports by default that make it easier to just go system out print line. You can instead just go print line. So that means public class, hello, curly brace, public static void main string, bracket, bracket arcs, curly brace, system out print line now becomes void main, curly brace, print line which is so much better. But the cool part, the coolest part about that proposal is, now what's the thing you wanna learn next? That's up to the thing that you're working with. If the problem that you're working with needs you to pass in an argument from the command line, learn how arguments work and put the string bracket bracket arcs in. If you wanna uh, write a different method, learn how methods work, create a method below the main one and start calling it. If you've done that and you realize, wait, but now it's so complicated, like I've got so many methods here, I want to split that out into a different class. Now is a great time to learn about how, you know, public, uh, about how, sorry, how to create a class and create the class wrapper that you can actually reference. So, and all of those things are independent from one another, mostly. So not only do you have to learn fewer concepts before you get started, you also delinearize uh, the sequence of, of, of concepts that you need to learn. You can then later have your basic program run, be happy about that, as I described earlier about programming. And then the next step is whatever your problem needs. And then you can learn the next concept as it solves the problem that you're having, uh, which is the best way to learn new stuff, right? You have a problem, you don't know how to solve it, you learn a new concept, and now the problem becomes solvable or maybe even easy. Um, and that you can do like in almost any order that you want. And that, so the idea is instead of having like the highway of Java concepts that you have to just jump on at full speed or be run over, uh, you can now have an on-ramp, like a highway, where you just like, you know, go on, pick up speed as you go until you're fast enough to go into the other lane and drive around the rest of the people. And I think that's a, that's a great idea. And I'm really looking forward to it because I think it's really important that uh, Java, uh, like Java is approachable, becomes more approachable, so that uh, more people start learning Java because it's a great language to work with. It has like, I mean, we have like four great IDEs. We have IntelliJ, Visual Studio Code, Eclipse, and NetBeans in no specific order. How many ecosystems can say that, that have like four top tier IDEs? We have at least three like dot level build systems, which like do all the things for you. We have unit testing frameworks, web frameworks, like everything that you can up with, we have like a handful of those. And that means you can always, there's competition, there's improvement, there's experimentation, there's, you can choose, do you want to go with a more 
um, with a more radical, the more progressive approach, or do you want to go with a more conservative approach? You can, in almost every area, you have different trade-offs and you can pick the right tool for the right job. So Java is a great language to, learn, to work in, but if you don't get there because you're turned off by something as seemingly trivial as the first couple of hours, and I'm just saying seemingly because the first, you're doing a ton of things for a few hours in your life, and for most of them, you decide that you don't want to do more hours of them. That's normal. And that's also normal for programming languages. And I think if Java makes it easy in the beginning, uh, it can allow way more people to enjoy uh, the full power of Java later in their career. So yeah. <laughs> so it was a little bit of a rant, but I really like this topic. I really appreciate what Brian gets us doing on this topic. So I want to say, uh, I would like that, should we skip the loom? Because now it's getting like, even starting to get late even for you guys. Yeah, I was about to say, we, we've gone for an hour and a half now, <laughs> despite technical difficulties. So uh, however you want to continue. Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know what, I give you like the, the cliff you. notes of Project Loom you, maybe. Before we continue yeah? that there's a 20 second delay here, or maybe even a 30 second delay. So when you ask a question or open a leading remark, just wait a bit so that we can respond. And that's just what I wanted to say right now. We're, we're aware, Barry. <laughs> okay, look, I give you the Cliff's Notes on Project Loom. Um, and the Cliff's Notes is this. There's an HTTP request coming into your backend. What do you do? Well, you take the request apart, parse some JSON, turn it into, you know, figure out what you have to do. Often you query a database for the data that you need to return. You get the database response back, put that into response, and send it over the wire. And you're using the system resources like your, specifically your, your, your runtime resources, really well for step one and three. And for step two, you're just sitting there and waiting. And uh, there are two ways to implement that. And one way is to just use a simple thread that does these simple steps. But that thread then blocks in step two. And a thread that maps to an operating system thread is expensive. You can have thousands of those, but you probably cannot have hundreds of thousands of those or millions. Somewhere between there's the line. So there's a different approach to doing this, which is like asynchronous programming, which tries to use threads much more judiciously to just use them when you actually need it for computation and not use a thread when we're just waiting for stuff. But that's, that totally restructures your whole programming model, which is not ideal and not everybody prefers doing it that way. And so there is a, a conflict between simplicity and throughput. Much like earlier when I said there's a conflict in Valhalla between performance and design. So once again, there's a project here that tries to get to the root of one of these conflicts and just make it go away. The way they do the, the way the proposal does this is with virtual threads. A virtual thread is like a regular thread, but it has a super low memory footprint, so it can have millions of those. It has a smaller switching cost, uh, meaning the, it's not an operating system switch between the threads, which has to have very high guards, so you don't get like, you know, like these branch prediction attacks that you got a few years ago and stuff like that going. But within the runtime, you don't have these concerns. So the Java runtime can manage this and they can do it, it can do it much faster. But the most important part is when a virtual thread is waiting, it doesn't require a platform thread. So how does that work? The, um, the request comes in, a virtual thread um, means that the runtime takes this task and puts it into a so-called carrier thread pool. And that carrier thread pool executes step one. And when it starts to block in step two, the virtual thread thinks it's blocking. So the code that you wrote is like regular run of the mill code, and that code thinks it's blocking now, which in the past, as I said, was is bad because that means it's blocking an expensive thread. But with virtual threads, what's happening, similar, like, similar to virtual memory, basically, um, you're not actually using a real resource at that point anymore. When you're blocking, the runtime comes in and says, oh, you've been you're blocking now? Well, your virtual thread, I'm going to put you over here, you think you're blocking. But the carrier thread who's done the actual computation, I give it back to the pool and it can do the next step. So that one is busy over there. Um, and then when the step two unblocks, the runtime realizes that and puts this task back into the, into the thread pool. And then the thread pool will at some point pick it up and a new carrier thread will be paired with a virtual thread and it continues its computation. So the code that you write and the code that you debug and the code that you need to analyze and profile, all of that and maintain, a super simple, well, simpler, straightforward code that looks like it's blocking. But when it's blocking, it's not actually taking up an expensive resource. 
it's just sitting somewhere in memory doing literally nothing. Whereas the operating system thread that is expensive and you can only have so many of those, that's busy doing something else. Okay, so that's Eclipse Nodes on virtual threads. Write simple blocking code. You can have millions of threads doing that. So you can get, you can get code that is as simple as the old blocking model, but comparatively performant to the asynchronous model. Depending, it can be like, I think current benchmarks often have it as equal performance, but slightly higher memory footprint. But surely that depends a lot on the problem at hand. And over the next years, there will probably be a lot of people, you know, doing detailed performance comparisons. But honestly, most projects don't care. It's 5%, 5% this way or that way. If they get to choose between something that's almost the same performance characteristics, but one of them has a much simpler coding model and it's much easier to maintain and to observe and to analyze, then that's what's going to be the important part, not the few percent. Some projects will need those few percent, but many won't. So that's, uh, that's, that's uh, Loom. Then there's also structure. So that's virtual threads, sorry. Then there's structure concurrency as a part of this. Super great feature as well. Can't go into that. Um, so instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the end of my talk and I'm going to uh, recommend once again to go to the YouTube Java channel. I didn't do that yet, but it was recommended earlier. Go to the YouTube Java channel, youtube.com YouTube slash Java, and check out, uh, specifically, if you're interested in Project Loom, the Jeb Cafes of, for my colleague Jose Pomar in recent uh, weeks and months. He's done, like, I think, four videos on this now, and they're amazing. They, they take you from, I have no idea what a virtual threat is, so not to I'm ready to start experimenting with it, which is great, because all of that has been merged as a preview in Java 19. So if you start with a new demo project, a new hobby project, or oh, don't tell anybody I told you this. If you start with a new professional project and you think it takes like a year for that to be out, you could kind of start working with virtual threads because in a year, maybe it's finalized. Once again, crossing fingers here, uh, but definitely great for experimentation. Uh, and so now's a great time to learn about virtual threads, learn about structured concurrency and start investing into learning that and reaping the benefits very, very soon. So, and with that, also I wrote a book about the model system nobody cares about. I mean, the book and the model system actually but if you're interested you can get that and i'm nipath x as i mentioned before you can find me under that name uh, on my website which is nipathx.dev and then on twitter and youtube and twitch and github and uh, dms are open wherever they exist uh you have to find my email address on my web page so on my web page holy shit i said all now oh, i was not supposed to swear sorry it's late here uh so yes on my website you can find my email address as well so you can get in touch any way you want uh, and I'm always glad to answer questions on Java. And with that, I'm going to give the stage back. So it'll give them, it'll be 20 seconds for them to catch up. Yeah. So they're watching the stream. You'll get this right instead of the Zoom call. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I see we should be streaming the, the Zoom link in the classroom, not the YouTube, but we'll, we'll discuss that offline. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they have access to the Zoom link. They so. should, yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, let's thank Nikolai. You want to come for, over here in front of the. Oh, yeah, so. well, I, I saw myself in there. So. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's okay. Thank, let's, let's, let's thank Nikolai for his time and the fact that it's probably about two o'clock in the morning in Germany. So uh, thank you very much, Nikolai. Thank you. Thank you. So a um, couple, of, couple of things. While, while you're giving your talk, I don't know if you know, uh, Nikolai, uh, JEP 431 was just made. Uh, okay. No. You're uh, kidding the, me. The um, sequence collections. Oh, so really? It's a new uh, JDK uh, that will be targeted for a particular uh, JDK version at some point. You know, so um, there, there's there's a quite a bit here uh, content to learn. Um, it's you know it's it's worth your time if you're interested to learn more about each of these projects and the various um, you know. The pieces of that with with Panama, with you know all the um, foreign memory calls and everything else, Project Room and virtual uh, threads and structured concurrency. I think extent local variables is going to be on that at some point, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, take a look. Um, that's that's a new JEP too, which came out within the last month or two. Um, uh, I, I, so, I was busy um, looking at the sequence you know, collections, Jeff, so I didn't get that. More, um, you know, you can you can always reach out to us or to or to Nikolai. Um, you know, follow him on Twitter. Watch the videos. If you go to inside.java, I think that's what it's called, right? Inside Java. Um, yeah, inside.java contains the, the videos. Can, yep. um, 
You can watch all the, they're all there. All the videos are there and you can learn quite a bit. Um, Billy Carando, SIP of Java are usually a minute, minute and a half. Um, and then I think the Java, um, Inside Java newscast could be anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the content. So I encourage you to go there. Um, so uh, at this point, we're sharing, right? Yes. Okay. I uh, just want to do a couple quick things. Uh, we have some upcoming events, as you can see. Uh, Java 1 is coming up. This is the first time it's Java 1 since 2017, thereabouts. Yeah. Uh, it was code 1 in those in between years. Uh, that's in Las Vegas. Um, our, um, our sponsors, um, JFrog, they run the Swamp Up conference, which is next Tuesday. And there are some discounts for our members. And then EclipseCon is the week after that. That was in that one's in Germany. QCon San Francisco. Um, QCon is part of uh, InfoQ. And uh, so they're having an in-person event in San Francisco in um, also that same week in October, late October. And then stay tuned for details on a Java day. Oracle is actually uh, sponsoring um, Java user groups. Uh, they'll provide two or three speakers uh, to come out roughly four hours. So we're planning something in the spring of next year. Most likely it'll be on a Saturday, but stay tuned. You know, if you're on our mailing list, you'll find out more about that. And, and then, you know, Oracle's going to provide the, not only the speakers, but swag and then and food as well. So, um, and then the um, the old Trenton Computer Festival has been around since 1976. That'll be in March of next year. So, uh, stay forward. These are all, this is local here in Ewing, New Jersey, only about maybe less than an hour from here. Um, upcoming meetings for us. Um, next month on November 8th, the second Tuesday, we're doing something new with the lightning talks. Um, we look, we're looking for, pre for, for presenters. We would like uh, anybody who's interested in, in speak, public speaking to give a talk on a topic of their choice for eight to 10 minutes. And so Barry's pointing to the kids already here. So, <laughs> so, um, so send an email to um, info at gsjug.org. And uh, stay tuned for more details on that. We have Justin Lee who will be here in December talking about Morphia, which is an ODM, uh, as opposed to ORM, um, for you know, MongoDB. And then we're, we're waiting on a title uh, from Mark Heckler, who is here February of 2020, but he'll be back and he'll be here on Tuesday, the 17th of next year, and then be in New York for the New York Java SIG the, the next night. We have a lot of friends for, you know, in, the, in our JSJUG, right? So Chicago is one of them. Uh, Mary Gugleski, who spoke with us, uh, spoke to our group back in February or March timeframe. Uh, they're, they, well, they were meeting tonight, same time. Um, but you will see that the What the Crack talk will also be in New York on Thursday, as you'll see in the next slide. Um, our folks in Philadelphia are um, going to have their meeting tomorrow. Well, Greg Taylor talking about the, the play framework. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let me get back there. Let me help. Yeah. <laughs> I clicked on the link by mistake. I think we're gonna be doing a lot of editing on this video. There we go. <laughs> um, let's see, where are we? Okay. Um, and as I mentioned before, the New York Java, uh, Java SIG, uh, they are have Garrett uh, Grunwald who will be uh, talking on crack which is cyclic redundancy, I, I forget. But um, uh, if you want to learn more about it, you can, uh, you can attend that meeting. And then the New England um, Java user group, they've uh, resurrected themselves. I think they've kind of merged with the Boston Java group and they are meeting this coming Friday and it's uh, title is Potent Up Some Chaos. And, um, and the Atlanta folks, um, they are, going to have a demystifying open source development talk on the 25th on uh, Tuesday, which is, I guess, is two weeks from tonight. I, I have one other announcement. Right. Oh. All right. I, Here's the best part. Other, uh, we are you still 30 away seconds away? License to IntelliJ IDEA. Um, once the uh, 
screen comes up, you'll you there's a QR code you can scan and then fill out the form and we'll randomly pick a winner. Uh, Mike, can you hear me? There we go. Okay. So take your phones on that, and uh, I'll leave that here for the for the time being. And um, if there are any questions uh, for Nikolai or ourselves, uh, Mike, can you hear me? Mike, nobody. You know, we, we did keep everybody awake, but they are young, Nikolai. You know, so uh, you know most of the students here. Is anybody here from the Madison High School, per chance? Okay. What's that? You're there now or did you graduate? Oh, you graduated. I so you're in college now. You're oh you're a student here. Okay. No, no, uh, Barry and Diana uh, spoke at Madison High School today and the high school students were invited to this uh, talk. Today, so so um, I know we had a handful of folks on YouTube and a couple of folks here on Zoom. So uh, you know we've had a very diverse crowd in terms of numbers. Um, and, you know, so we apologize for all the technical difficulties. Um, you know, it's, it's this is our first time going back to a hybrid approach. And um, and it, yes. Scott says he's trying to talk. Oh, OK. I, I don't hear him. I don't hear either him. because let's ah. let's be quiet for a sec okay. and we will get him on. Can you hear me, guys? Um, you know, so we apologize for all the Hello? Oh. <laughs> huh? Yeah, it's got to ask you a question because they're 30 second delay. Okay. Uh, I, I meant to put this in the slides earlier, but I didn't get a chance. Uh, we're also doing, this is a personal plug, but it's free book, so I'm plugging it anyway. But uh, we're giving away a copy of our, uh, Gene and I, Gene Byarski and I have written a new Java practice textbook, and we're doing a giveaway on the Code Ranch this week. So if you go on the Code Ranch and post in the certification forum, uh, you could win a copy of the book that's going to be drawn on Friday. So I just wanted to let everybody know it's a free Java book if you're interested. And if you didn't hear that clearly because he was talking fast, that's coderanch.java. No, okay. I know I said it wrong. Coderanch.com. Yeah. I think that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. We'll verify that. Right. <laughs> um, so I always like to end. Um, let's see. All right. Oh, there we go. Okay. So anyway, this is one of my, well, once we, once we get the delay over here, it's one of my favorite slides coming up once we get through the delay. But uh, once I get home, I'll be able to indulge in one of these. It does come up eventually. Yes, eventually. There we go. All right. Perfect. So, um, but yeah. So Mike's so, a beer fan. Yes, very much a craft beer fan. And I told Nikolai in an email uh, you know, earlier this week or, or late last week, I said, you know, it's too bad he wouldn't hear in person. We'd be more than happy to show him what some of the craft beer in New Jersey is like around here. So, <laughs> but uh, we, you know, maybe we'll we'll meet at a conference at some point. So, we'll look forward to that. But um, are there any other questions, Scott or Neha, or um, you know, in the? Uh, I didn't see any, but let me let me double check. Um, I don't think so. No, yeah, we're good. I think. Okay. All right. With that, um, uh, Nikolai, thanks once again. Uh, you know, definitely it's time for you uh, to uh, go to bed. <laughs> we appreciate you staying up. 
you you like you like one of about you know five or six of the presenters we've had who have accommodated our 6 30 p.m eastern time uh start time so we definitely appreciate you staying up um i'm an early bird so i'm usually up at four in the morning <laughs> so, i'm just a plain old bird that's right that's right that'd be you rd but uh yeah so um anyway thanks again and um we, we'll talk to you at some point and and yep. folks thank you for coming out tonight for our first in-person event and we certainly appreciate it so yeah. all right folks Ooh. <laughs> thanks <laughs>